one of the scribes came up to Jesus and asked him, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus replied, the first is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You are right in saying he is the one and there is no other than he. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered with understanding, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I don't know if I know what that means. I really don't know if I know what that means. I know what the concept is, okay? I'm not, uh, I'm thick, but I'm not that thick. I know what they're saying. I'm not really sure if I sat here and said, okay, this is exactly what it means. You get up in the morning, you do this, that, and the other. When you do this, you think of that. When you do this, you think of that. When you do, I don't know to say to love the Lord with, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. To me, it's asking for an ever-present God consciousness, okay? And, you know, now, that may be, uh, a good explanation, but explain me, Lucy. I don't know what that means. An ever-present God consciousness. And, and that is, is part of that means that I have to look at me and see that I am who I am by the grace of God. I am who I am in the sight of God. Nothing more nothing less. And when I start to think of that, uh, it's really interesting. I, uh, I look at my life as being very blessed. I think I, an absolutely wonderful family. Uh, my father's deceased, my mother's sick. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I love each other, we're very close. If they've got something, it's mine. If I've got something, it's theirs. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I am so very blessed to have the family that I have. Now, I look at each one of them as a gift from God. I really do. You know, they, their love, their understanding, their generosity to me, that's what God is. That's what God does. That's how God cares for his people. You know, I, I, look, I look at the gift of priesthood and I, and, and, and I think, man, if you're all knowing and all powerful, couldn't you get someone a lot more qualified and a lot holier than me? I mean, no, he chose me. I believe that with all my heart. Why he chose me, you know, warts and all, uh, it's, it's, it's a gift, it's a gift. When I stand at the altar of God and say, take this, but this is my body, 
and eat of it and take this and drink this, for this is my blood. And I imitate the gift that God gave to the world. Man, doesn't get any better than that. You don't get any more blessed than that. And so in my mind, I think every, every encounter in life has got to include God. We've recently had a rash of few people kind of terrorizing the office area, lying, swiping stuff, doing, and, and they're very open about it. And I have to deal with them. I'm not real sure I'm God conscious when I'm dealing with them because I'm aggravated. You know, I tried to help them, but that didn't. Whatever help you gave wasn't nearly as much as what they stole. And I'm aggravated. And I don't think I, at this point, approach him with God consciousness. I think I, you know, approach them like a gnat. They're just here to aggravate me, okay? And, and so that challenge in life to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So then I go to him and I try and talk. You know, nothing but one excuse after the other. Nothing but one lie after the other. Nothing but this is why they won't get a job. And this, hey, everybody knows. Anybody wants a job today, you can get five of them wherever you go. The workforce is so depleted. No, it's not good enough for him. He deserves better. And I'm going, you know, man, you, you're going around and you say you're hungry. And you're begging for food, but you're not going to work. And I, that's where this God consciousness, that's where it gets pretty sticky. You know, loving the concept of God, understanding God's creation, understanding God's miracle, understanding God's mercy, God's compassion, God's for, for forgiveness. That works pretty good, you know? And as a priest, I can, people who are hurting and everything, I can, I can bring that in God's name. Mercy, compassion, care, I can bring that. But then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. I got news for you. And I think we all know them. When they die, you're going to have to bury them nine feet deep. Because deep down, they're really good. But on the outside, they're not showing you much. They can be pretty aggravating. They can be pretty challenging. And that's where I struggle to see this person is made in the image and likeness of God. You know, we've had a rash of, of attacks on Catholic churches. And one recently in Denver and you know, it's my womb and my choice and, you know, painted what would have been the area of the Blessed Mother's womb, red, bloody, and, I, you know, I, I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, I'm really struggling here to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbors yourself. I really struggle with that. And I'm not sure in this segment, by the time we're through, I'm going to give you the solution to it. But those are the times where probably more than ever, that God consciousness needs to bring me to prayer, needs me to bring me to prayer with certain people, that I have to deal with on somewhat of a regular basis. And you deal with those people and you say, well, ah, I don't see it. I'm not feeling God-like. I'm not feeling that God is watching over this situation. And that's what we need to pray for. And that's a challenge in all of our lives. 
love in the concept of God's mercy and his wisdom and his goodness and his creation, but learning how to deal with that with other people. One of the things I think we all have to overcome is looking at external prejudices. I'm going to tell a story on myself. I was, I was at an international religious conference on human trafficking. We were in the lobby of the hotel waiting to drive to the Vatican. And here is this Muslim guy, the black turban and the gray flowing gown and everything like that, you know. And I had just seen something about this guy, al-Baghdadi, who was, you know, the, the, the big terrorist and everything. And this guy was dressed just like him. And I said, okay, I'll, I, you know, I'm not supposed to do this. And I walked up to him and introduced myself. He was the grand imam of Lebanon. And my family is from Lebanon. And when I told him that, you know, my family was Lebanese, the hug and the kiss and, oh, please come, you know, you come visit us. We take care of you. We show you Lebanon. We do this. We do that. And I had looked at him on the outside and said, uh-uh, that's how terrorists dress. That's what I said. That's where I struggle. People can look, the way people are dressed, where their tattoos are, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever. And we come to conclusions in our own heart about, well, they must be, and, and, and you can fill in the quote, but a lot of us have those innate prejudices because of their color, the way they dress, their country of origin, whatever, we've already decided they're not as good as we are. That's the first thing we need to do and love your neighbors yourself. The fact that there are some people who don't respond to God's gifts and God's graces and make it very difficult to deal with them, those people, we pray our way through it. But to take someone and just think they're outside of God's love because of where they were born, what their religious beliefs are, what their country of origin is, it's so wrong. It is so wrong. And that's the, that's the thing that I offer for you as hope. That made in the image and likeness of God. How can I tell God I love him, but I don't like any of these kids of his? I can't do that. If I walk up to a married couple and say, I think y'all are so great. I'd love to be good friends, but keep your kids away from me because I don't like them. What? How do we say we love God? And that's the challenge. And I haven't figured it all out yet. Not sure I will. But the challenge for all of us is just not to allow any of the externals to keep us from loving and recognizing God in the face of every human being we meet. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. 
When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of slander against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. All Saints Day, the people blessed among us. One of the comedians that I think is really funny and has a keen insight into human nature is a guy by the name of Jeff Foxworthy. And he's got this whole series, you might be a redneck if. But one of the things that he says that I think is so funny is if you preface something with bless their heart, it sounds like you're being kind. And so bless their heart, they're just so ugly. <laughs> you know, it sounds like you're being kind because you said bless your heart as a preface to it, you know. Bless your heart, you're just so dumb, aren't you, you know? And whenever I read the Beatitudes, you know, part of that reminds me when our Lord talks about the blessed. And most of us, you know, blessed to you uh, who are meek, who mourn, uh, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, a merciful, clean of heart, persecuted for the sake of righteousness, I'm going, well, if that's the list of blessings, do you have another option here? Because I don't think that really is what we're talking about. But as we celebrate All Saints Day, one of my great quotes that I, I, I read was, saints were sinners just like us who kept trying. And I love the quote that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. On this day, which we traditionally recognize, remember, and pray for our beloved deceased, it's really, really important that we understand what made them holy? And I'm convinced that there are many, many people who are saints and live saintly lives, and they will never ever be recognized by the Roman calendar, but they're going to be recognized in the hearts and the minds of people that they've loved and people that they've left behind. And I think that understanding of true holiness, and when, when, I, when I think of a saint, and if you say, well, what, you know, what, what are the characteristics of a saint? Aside from having a true personal relationship with God and desiring to be pleasing in God, in the sight of God. I think when we talk about a saint, we talk about someone who has 
selflessness. That they're the ones who are always the last. There's a great story told by a guy by the name of Ben Vereen. People of a certain age will remember the, uh, the movie Roots, the television movie Roots. And Ben Vereen is a guy who played Chicken George. And he was talking about growing up. And he said, you know, they really were poor. And his mother was able to afford a donut, a, you know, Dale stale donut every morning that she cut into three for his brothers and sisters. And so each one of them would, would eat their third of the donut. And they'd say, Mama, but what about you? She said, don't worry, baby. I ate the whole, the donut whole. And, you know, it, it, it was those, those are the people who have lived in our lives, who have been part of our lives, who have made this tremendous, tremendous impact on us by their selflessness. When I was a young priest, I became friends with a retired priest by the name of Monsignor Irving de Blanc. And Monsignor Irving de Blanc was one of these people that when you were in the room, you were the most important person in the room. All he could talk about was you and your wonderful gifts and abilities or efforts or whatever it was. I later came to find out when he died, he was nationally recognized, did most of the work in the 1960s on marriage and family life, but he never talked about him. He talked about me. He talked about you. He talked about us. He wanted us to feel better about ourselves because he was around. And those are the people who I think in the course of our lives have made tremendous differences. And we look at things like, and, and, and I'll never forget this, this couple and they lived, uh, you know, kind of out in the woods. And there was this little three-room house. He was a carpenter. But there was a three-room house where he raised nine children. And his ninth child was born with some physical birth defects, which meant that that child never walked or talked or got dressed on its own. And they kept him in that house till he was 17 years old when he died. And going to visit him at home. This old wooden house, and he was a master carpenter, but all the boards didn't even match in his own home. So and in the summertime, the heat came through. In the wintertime, the, the, the cold came through. And all he could say was, you know, I hope we did the best we could. God has been so good to me, allowing me to raise nine kids and eight of them to live. And I'm so proud that I was able to keep a roof over their head and my children never went hungry. Those are the saints among us. Those are the people that we have lived all of our lives seeing. And unfortunately, a lot of us had to get a lot older before we could understand it. I've oftentimes talked about my, my, my grandmother, my Lebanese grandmother, where we ate lunch every Saturday but she would always walk up to me and pat my stomach and go, smala. I thought smala meant fat, okay? But smala means God's blessings. She would pat me on the belly and say, oh, you're so healthy. God has blessed you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy, mommy. And, 
you know, and, and, and she was the one that when she died, I was one of her 16 grandchildren. We all got to go to the house to get something out of her house. And one of my cousins walks in, and, and of course, like I said, we had lunch every Saturday day, and it was, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 people, who knows? My cousin walked in, he said, I want to get that pot that she cooked the rice in that's about this big and serves 40 people, okay? He said, it was the damnedest thing. I don't care how many people came, there was always enough. And, you know, she was the one that, you know, uh, she had a daughter who, who was a nun. And, and she said, you know, uh, she said, Mama told me I was beautiful for so long, I actually started to believe it. You know, like she said, I really wasn't, but she kept telling me I was. And those are the people. Those are the people that we honor today that long gone, They've died and they've gone before us. But had it not been for them, had it not been for their life, had it not been for their example, I don't know where I'd be today. And I doubt those of you listening to this broadcast would be where you are. And one of the things that always, I think is very necessary to say for those of us who were blessed to have this wonderful living example of holiness and unselfishness, for those of us who were this blessed, we have the responsibility to make sure the next generation has that same example. They didn't give us these blessings and these examples so that we could be spoiled and think more of ourselves than oftentimes we should. They gave us this example so that we could not only honor their memory, but we could continue their legacy by imitating their example and passing it on to the next generation. For all the holy men and women who may or may not be declared saints in the sight of the church. We give thanks to Almighty God for giving us someone to make us the people we are. And let us all pray for the strength to be able to pass that example on. God bless you, and may each day bring you close in your walk with the Lord.